So as we recall again uh, from last class, we said, okay, so when a partnership realizes tax items, uh, gain, loss, deduction, income, those items flow through to the partners. There's this you know, issue about separately stated versus non-separately stated, but that's really just a, an administrative thing. Um, ultimately, it all flows through to the partners. And in general, each partner is gonna report on their own return uh, the tax items, their share of the tax items. And we're gonna to talk today, uh, begin to talk today about how do we determine which partner gets which. Um, but for now, we'll bracket that off. And the only exception to this idea that you include your share of tax items on your own tax return is 704D, um, which stops uh, losses in certain cases. And they'll say, okay, these are your losses. They ordinarily would go on your individual return, but they're, they're not gonna go on there this year. They're gonna be suspended. They're gonna be stopped. And so in this problem here, we have um, C and D, and C has a low outside basis of five, D has a higher outside basis of 15. And in, UK, in uh, A, there's 20,000 of partnership loss and they're shared equally between C and D. So normally C and D would each report their share of the, 10, uh, of the 20 of loss, 10 each. And for D, it's not a problem. D has plenty of outside basis, his outside basis is 15. Uh, we're only flowing through losses of 10. That leaves um, five of outside basis left. So D is fine, 704 D doesn't apply to D. But for C, uh, we would flow through uh, under 704 A under the general rule, 10,000 of loss to C. That's her share of the loss. But 704 D comes in and says, well, C's outside basis at the end of the year, by the year, by the way, we're flowing all of this through at the end of the year, so December 31. So December 31, we ask, well, what is C's outside basis? And what we're told C's outside basis is five. So we can only flow through five of the loss. Um, under 704A, C would get 10, but 704D st steps in and says, uh, no, C, you only get five. Um, and so the answer is C would claim five of the loss in year one, and then would, care, would have a suspended loss of five going forward. So then the next year, going on to B, now we have 20,000 of net income. So then again, we would allocate 10 to each partner uh, and each partner, um, oh, by the way, with the loss just in A, getting back, that the 10 of loss that flows through to D reduces her outside basis to five under 705, section 705. Uh, and C, C is allowed only a 5,000 of loss, so it reduces C's outside basis to zero. So whenever 704D is triggered, by definition, C's, your outside basis is gonna be zero. Okay, so then B, we have 20,000 of income that the partnership realizes, again, 10 allocated to each of, C, each of C and D. There is no limitation on income. You're gonna, you, know, you have to report the income that's allocated to you. There's nothing that's gonna stop it. So they each report the 10,000 of income and that's gonna increase their outside bases. D's back up to 15 and C's is gonna go up to 10. Well, now C can take the suspended loss. That 5,000 of loss that was disallowed in year one now, again, we look at the end of the, at the end of the year, her C's basis is 10 now. That's enough to claim the five of loss. And so she claims a loss of five in year two. Okay, um, and just to step back conceptually, that's the way 704D works. Just to step back conceptually, um, it's this, it's this negative basis problem. Um, and we see it in two contexts. So let's say you have a zero outside basis in your partnership. So you haven't contributed anything uh, and you have no share of the partnership debt. And you get distributed a dollar of cash. So now it's a distribution, not an allocation of a tax item, but distribution, the partnership distributes a dollar of cash. Normally cash distributions will reduce your outside basis and they'll be tax-free. 
But we know 731A1 says if you have a distribution of cash in excess of outside basis, you have gain. And so we tax you on that dollar because we can't drive your basis down below zero. And that's really the only choice we have. That dollar is going to have basis. You know, the dollar bill is going to have a basis of a dollar. So once we conclude that you're not going to have a negative basis, we're not going to give you a low basis in cash. Uh, cash is always equal to basis in face. Then we have to tax you on that dollar or otherwise just let gain escape the system, right? Because you're taking your zero basis partnership interest and you're going to end up with a dollar basis in that cash. So basis without tax is phantom is a, is going to be a tax windfall. So we deal with that problem when we have a distribution of cash in, uh, in excess of outside basis where the distribution would otherwise take your basis below zero and we tax you on that excess. We have the same problem is again, now you have a zero outside basis. Now you get allocated a dollar of loss. And in both cases, you might say, well, how, do, how if I have a zero outside basis, how could I be out? How could I get a dollar of cash? How could I be allocated loss? Where is the money coming from? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the money could be coming from some other partner contributed it. It's getting distributed to you or the money is being used to fund losses. It could be money that was borrowed by the partnership. You, you didn't get allocated the debt. So you could be a, it could be a recourse debt. You could be a limited partner. So there are ways that this can happen. Uh, but if it does happen, now you're, again, you're supposed to get allocated dollar of deduction or loss. You have no outside basis. And um, in that case, if we allowed that to flow through without giving you a negative basis, uh, we would see you would end up duplicating that loss. We saw that from last class. And so we have the, the remedy there is, well, we just stop. We say, okay, you're not allowed to take this loss. We will, you know, eventually you may, if you have enough outside basis in later years, but we're going to suspend the loss. Okay, any questions about A or B? We covered that last class. I know it was pretty quick, but any questions on that or 704D? Okay, well, uh, let's think about this a little bit more. So now we can say, okay, how does C fix this problem? And let's, uh, let's identify the problem here. Why C doesn't like this answer, general, this result generally. So the result is, We got C and D, and we got year one. And C is allowed five of loss in year one. D is allowed ten of loss in year one. In year two, C has five of income, and D has ten of income. And so the net is zero. And in a world without time value of money. Nobody, you know, this is fine, right? And if in a fictional world where we don't care about time value of money, um, this is fine. Okay, remember, in a world without 704D, I'll put this in brackets, he would have gotten 10 and 10. He would have been just like D. But because of the time value of money, C is being deprived of uh, 5,000 of loss in year one, and then he's having 5,000 less income in year two. So that's a one year deferral that he's being deprived of this. Um, so that's why C doesn't like this, this rule. It's modest in some sense because it's only one year and it's only five and we add a bunch of zeros to it. We can make it interesting really quickly, right? If this were $5 million, you'd rather have a, a $10 million loss in year one, even if it means a $10 million income in year two as compared to 5 million loss in year one and 5 million income in year two. You've gotten that float, if you will, of that 5 million deduction that you've gotten to use for one year. Now, again, if C is, C's tax rates may be going up uh, in your, um, well, uh, let me strike that. Um, yeah, C's tax rates may be going up. If it goes up from year one to year two, then the incentives are turned on its head. But if C's in the same bracket, year one, year two, that's just a time valued money play. So C looks at this and says, I don't want my $5,000 loss to be suspended, $5 million loss to be suspended. So uh, what 
options, planning options might we have for C? So anybody have any thoughts on that? So C comes to you, it's approaching the end of the year, year one, and you tell C, yeah, it's looking like you're gonna have 5,000 suspended losses in year one. And C says, I don't like that, I wanna use my losses now. Thoughts? What could C do? There's some simple stuff that C could do that I hope everyone, well, not everyone, but some people would be thinking of that, you know, you could do, I mean, that would be pretty easy to fix, but it, uh, as a technical matter, but would be changing the deal a little bit. What's the, what's, what is C's problem here? Basis is too low. His outside basis is too low. So how do you get more outside basis? How does he get more outside basis? He make uh, contributions of property. Sure, he could have. So he could. So that's the that's the simple, but probably not really. Um, well, but again, tax lawyers. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get better tax results for their clients without changing the deal too much. And if you say to C, you say, "Yeah, well, fine. You know, you can get that. Just put in five million more cash, right? Well, assuming these are all millions." Just put in five million more cash into the partnership, and you don't really want to say that to your client because that's not so simple to put five million in cash into the partnership. Now, I mean, now that's a big change. But he could—he could put five million of cash in. He could put property in with a five million dollar basis. But that really quite radically changes the the economics of the deal. So, um, so that one you might want to—if you suggest it, you might want to caveat it with, I know this may be tough to swallow, but this is, you know, this is the easy, you know, the easiest thing to do. You don't need to do too much. So that's one way. What's another way to get C more outside basis? Let's assume the partnership has debt. How might we get C more outside basis if the partnership has debt? Well, remember, um, if there's recourse debt, then your share of the partnership uh, debt which becomes your part of your basis um, is depends on your share of the economic risk of loss. So let's assume that these are both general partners in a partnership, so they're both liable and they might be sharing the debt 50-50 because they're 50% um, general partners. Well, C might think about inde you know, uh, indemnifying D for some of the debt and say, okay, D, I'll take on an extra 5 million of the debt in year one under this hypothetical economic risk of loss scenario. So I'll indemnify and hold you harmless to up to $5 million of the debt. And therefore 5 million of the share of the debt would shift over from D who doesn't, who doesn't really need it. Remember D has that extra 5,000 cushion, 5 million cushion at the end of year one it goes over to C and now C's outside basis would go up because now it's a constructive contribution of money. And the beauty of that is if the economic risk of loss is more theoretical than real. So if C looks at the financial situation, says, yeah, remember economic risk of loss, we're gonna talk about this a lot more. It basically assumes a doomsday scenario, everything's worthless and who is on the hook to pay. Well, C looks at the assets of the partnership. Nah, everything's not going to go worthless. That's not that's not a realistic risk. That it's a theoretical risk. It's not really much of a practical risk. And so I'm willing to sort of take on a little bit more of this risk because it's small in order to get this better tax result. So that's changing the deal less dramatically because you're really changing something that's technical and not real. Yeah. Now again, you have to warn C and say, even though right, I mean things happen like the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, where things look good on day one, and then a couple of days later, they look like, you know, crap. But um, that may be more palatable for C to take than to write a check or contribute property with 5 million basis. Any uh, questions on those two remedies, those two planning options? Another one to think about would be, um, 
would be to give some of these losses to D. Remember D, let's start and give, uh, give, put their outside bases up here. So C's outside basis starts at five. So it ends up at five. D's outside basis starts at 15 and it ends at 15. So another way to look at this is this 5,000 of loss here that's suspended is denied to everybody. It's sitting there in thin air. It's not going to anybody. Um, and so another thing to think about would be, well, let's change the allocation. Let's allocate, let's amend the partnership agreement and let's allocate 75% of the loss in year one to D instead of 50%. And then in year two, let's allocate 75% of the income to D. So I'll put this in red. So the alternative is we would go and we would give D 15 of the loss. He has enough outside basis and 15 of the income. And again, he ends up at 15. And C would get, as he gets now, five and five. So we're taking the suspended loss and effectively giving it to D. Um, which is better viewing the partners collectively than having it just sit in thin air. And so that, that may be something you think about and we'll talk about special allocations um, starting this class. And you might say, well, why would C do that? You know, to be a nice guy? Probably not, but C would do that um, and, and, and get compensated in some way. Um, that may be, um, they may could amend the deal in some other way to say, okay, D, you're getting this extra 5 million of loss in year one, you know, 5 million of income in year two. Again, so it's a 5 million time value money um, deduction, you know, benefit. And so whatever that's worth, D might pay to C through some other concession in the partnership agreement, the amended partnership agreement to make it, you know, to give C uh, a portion of the benefit. So C is effectively sort of selling his suspended losses to D. Um, and that may be something to think about as well. So again, we talked about trying to get D C more outside basis through contributing more cash or property or taking on more debt, more economic risk of loss. And then another option would be, you know, C effectively sells it through to D by amending the partnership agreement and allowing D to claim 75% of the loss and 75% of the income. There's some other risk, you know, maybe the income doesn't come in, come to fruition in year two. That's a risk that D is gonna have to think about. So we'll get into that later on, but just for now. Wouldn't C have less uh, loss in income though? Cause they're still at five. Why would they stay at five and D would go up to 15? So what would it be doing is you would say, okay, 75% um, of the loss and the losses we have a total of 20 of loss and 20 of income. So the base case would be allocate the loss 10 and 10. And of course, five would be suspended. And what we're doing is we're saying, okay, instead of 50 50, we're going to allocate the loss 75% to D and 25% to C. So that's what gets D15. That's what gets C5. So now C has no suspended losses, but you only get, you only get allocated by. And then we're gonna flip it, right? so it's a flip arrangement. We're gonna flip it around and say, okay, 75% of the income in year two is gonna be allocated to D. That gets into 15 and only five to C. And now there's no suspended losses that we take into account. So, you know, C is in the same place as he is before. D is better off. And again, C could do that out of his kind heart, likely not, but C does it to get some other concession from D uh, in the partnership agreement. Okay, and again, Yes. 
Is there any like um, limitation on how you can use these like planning mechanisms? Like, can you do it every year and just like flip back and forth or? Yeah, so we're yeah. Gonna, it's a good thinking. We're gonna we're going to get into that um, you know, in the next four classes more so. But the answer is that you uh, in terms of how you could amend the tax return for year one as late as your filing of your tax return in year one. So if you're a calendar year partnership, you can amend your allocations for year one as late as uh, April 15th of year two, retroactive allocation. So you could do that. There are limitations that we'll see about how much game playing we can do. And so the bottom line, as we'll see, is that to, for this to be effective, there's going to have to be some risk that this is going to you know, har harm or benefit D. And so if it was locked in, that there's no doubt. If there, if there was guaranteed 20 of loss in year one and 20 of income in year two, then this scheme wouldn't work. Um, we'll see. But if there were some um, volatility of an expectation. So if this could have been, you know, 15 to 25, and this could have been 15 to 25, then it's not just a tax play. And so that's a complicated way to explain that um, there's gate, there's planning that can be done, but it's not unrestrained. And again, the next four classes will 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 focus in on that issue. Good questions. Anybody else? Okay, and then. Um, in uh, what do we have? We have part uh, in the next uh, fact pattern, next part, uh, part D. We have um, the same facts as original, but we're going to add one little element. So, again, we've got C as an outside basis of five. And D as an outside basis team. And in year one, we've got a 15,000 ordinary loss. And a 5,000 capital loss. And D is really easy because D's got you know, this is only 20 of loss again. So D is really easy because uh, D's uh, 10 of those losses collectively will go to D. And so just half of them will flow through to D. Before we only had one character, it was just a plain vanilla ordinary loss. So we didn't have to deal with this complexity. But now we do. And so that's fine for D. D will report 7.5 of ordinary. 2.5 capital loss, and again, I'll end up with an outside base at the end of year one of five. The question is, what about C? C is only allowed five of the losses, but he would ordinarily get 10 without 704D. So how do we um, how do we determine what share of his loss is allowed and what share is not? The regulations, we'll take a look at this regulation in a second. You might turn there now. 1.704-1D. Um, the examples that we'll go through, we'll look at in a second, take a pretty um, um, uh, 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 predictable approach here. And they just say, look, if you have multiple types of losses and some are disallowed and some are not, you're going to allocate uh, the loss. You're going to prorate the loss. And so here for C, we have 5,000 of loss allowed. Allowed to see. You've got 10,000 of loss um, allocated to see total. So this is our total. This is our 704D limited loss. So that fraction is one half. So one half of each type of loss and deduction is allowed to see, and one half is suspended. So we would ordinarily give C 7.5 of the ordinary loss. So he only gets one half of it the current year. He would normally get 2.5 of the capital loss. He only gets one half of it the current year. 
his outside basis is zero, and his suspended losses consist of the other half. Suspended. So again, you're gonna take a fraction, and the numerator is the loss that's pure allowed in the current year. The denominator is the loss that would be allowed to you in total, but for 704D. That's gonna be a fraction. And that fraction represents the portion of the losses that are allowed currently. And the remaining amounts are gonna be the fraction of the loss that is suspended. So again, if we run this through to year two, where we have twenty thousand of ordinary income, it's pretty simple. We allocate that to D. We allocate half of it to C, and now. The suspended losses are allowed. And so that's the result. Okay, now again, in part A, we didn't have any complication because this is all one type of loss. So if you only have one type of loss, whether it's capital or ordinary, here in this fact was ordinary, you don't have to determine what portion of the loss is allowed, you know, what what character of the loss is allowed and what character is suspended. There's only one character. Here we have two characters. Uh, and this could be more complicated. We could have a 1231 loss, we could have um, investment interest deduction, I all this separately stated, so you could have a whole slew. You know, in, our, in our class, we won't have to get that complicated, but you can see the, uh, the approach. Okay, questions on D? Okay, and then the last question is going to be if um, it, the bottom line is your, your suspended losses are personal to you as a partner. They are not transferable, um, with one exception. But they're not transferable. Um, and when you die, uh, if a partner is a human being, an individual partner dies with suspended losses, they're gone forever. So you carry them forward and forward and forward for yourself, but never can transfer them. The exception is going to be uh, a transfer incident to a divorce. So if you, uh, husband and wife, spouses divorce, um, and uh, one part of partnership interest um, goes from spouse to spouse in the divorce, the suspended losses will, will, will follow. Any questions about that? All right, well, let's look at the regulations real quick. So that 1.704-1B, the reg I had up there before, let's take a quick look at that. So it's right here, limitation on allowance of losses. And it pretty much says what the code says. So the, the code, if you look at 704D2, I believe it talks about the carryover and it's really, really nonsensical the way the code talks about the carryover, it talks about something being repaid it's just really bad language, but the reg makes clear that how you deal with suspended losses. Any loss disallowed, any suspended loss shall be allowed to deduct at the end of the first succeeding partnership taxable year and subsequent partnership taxable year to the extent that the partner's outside base at the end of any such year exceeds zero before taking into account the suspended loss. Uh, D2 talks about, well, how do you determine someone's outside basis for purposes of flowing this through? 
And so we're again, we're on December 31, we didn't know what is the outside basis. And we know outside basis can go up or down for a variety of reasons. It can go up um, because you get allocated income. It can it goes down because of losses and deductions. It goes down because of distributions. Let's say December 31, you have some allocations of income, separately stated income, and then you have a distribution of cash also on December 31, and then you have an allocation of suspended loss. Let's say it's a large suspended loss. So what is your outside basis? What comes first? And so this is an ordinary rule. And so your outside basis first goes up by your allocations of income. So again, the different types of income that you get allocated. And then it goes down for everything but the losses. So the distributions of cash will reduce your outside basis. And then you test to see what your outside basis is. And then the next sentence deals with that, uh, the allocation if you have multiple types of losses. How, what portion is your suspended portion? What portion is your allowed portion? And this tells you that you prorate in accordance with uh, the amount of each particular loss. And then we're gonna see in this class that examples are really useful. So if you want to, students that they want a lot of examples, and the, the book has a lot of examples, right, in the text, the casebook. We go through examples and the problems. In the regs, there are lots of problems. And so here we see a set of problems. And so in four, D4, uh, and each of these three problems you can go through on your own. They, they illustrate different points. Um, example one just talks about how you suspended losses get used up in later years as the partner has outside basis. Example two illustrates a situation where a partner gets outside basis in later year by virtue of shifting liabilities. And then three is an illustration of the ordering rule we just talked about, how your outside basis goes up by your positive items before you see how, uh, how much outside basis you have for flowing through losses. And then also how you allocate or apportion, prorate the allowed losses and the disallowed losses. So here, in this example, they're allowed five sixths of each loss instead of one half, like in our problem. So I encourage you to, when you study this stuff, to look at these examples, make sure you understand them. Um, and again, they're good practice problems. Okay, questions on 704D. Now, frankly, 704D tends not to come up very much in partnership because partnership. Uh, Subchapter K is generous. It allows partners to get in their outside basis their share of, part of entity level debt. So we have the same rule 1366D in subchapter S. And subchapter S is a flow through regime, but it doesn't allow the owners to get their share of entity level debt. And so 1366D can come up quite a bit uh, because you see the entity borrows a bunch of money. And that, that money funds losses. And typically in like the early years of a business, you'd have losses. And to the extent that debt is funding those losses, um, the shareholders will be able to take in the current year those losses only to the extent of their equity contributions. Like, and so again, if they contributed, so let's again, let's say the owners contribute 10 and they borrow 90. And in year one, they lose 20, the entity loses 20. Well, only 10 of that represents the cash they contributed. The other 10 is funded by the debt, so you'll have suspended losses. In partnership, that's not going to happen as frequently because the partners will generally get, will get their share of the partnership debt and that will trace to their allocations of losses. Um, so it tends not to be nearly as significant as in subchapter. S, but nevertheless, it's there and can, prop, cut, can come up in uh, certain situations. 
Um, okay, let's uh, take a look at 704 of the code. So turning now, we're going to start to talk about which partners get which allocations. So if we turn to 704A of the code. Well, even let's go a little bit even uh, uh, to 702A, just as a refresher. 702A, remember, says that each partner takes into account his share, his allocation, share to share allocation of the partnership's tax items. These are all tax items. So uh, that, that gets reported to the partners. They include that on their own return, just as if they earned it directly or incurred it directly. 704 then discusses, well, what's your share? And it starts off deceptively simple. And it says a partnership should be a share. And again, I think, you know, if I were you, I might rewrite that, you know, cross out distributive share and say allocations. Distributive share, again, implies that there's some distribution that's related, that's there, there you know, it's, uh, distributions and allocations are kept separate. Alloc we allocate tax items, items of income, gain, loss, deduction. You distribute cash or property. There's a, there's a logical relationship between the two. Um, you know, if you're going to distribute cash, oftentimes the cash is income you've earned. Um, but there's no necessary relationship year to year. So um, anyway, a partner's allocation of income loss deduction shall, except it's otherwise provided, be determined by the partnership agreement. So the general rule is really simple, which is says, look at the partnership agreement, which is often written. In a sophisticated partnership, there will be a written partnership agreement. It doesn't have to be, it can be an oral agreement, but that would be, you know, could be really problematic. But and a partnership agreement will often, again, if it's sophisticated, will have a section that will say tax allocations. And it's going to tell you how to allocate tax items. So that's the general rule. But 704B is famously limiting to that. That is a limitation here in 704B. We're going to spend a lot of time in 704B. And it says, on the other hand, a partnership partner's allocation shall be determined in accordance with the partner's interest in the partnership. If, so now we have a different standard. So again, in A, it's elective. We get to choose, we get to say how our tax items are allocated. Now we say, well, it's allocated in accordance with this partner's interest, interest in the partnership standard. Let's call that PIP, with the PIP standard. in two situations. One is gonna be where the partnership agreement is silent about allocations, or there is no partnership agreement regarding allocations. Well, I guess that would be the same, there's a silent, there's not, you know, again, you could have a partnership agreement, and if, you were, if you're not thinking about taxes, you might not have a provision in your partnership agreement that says tax allocations. And that's typically not the case with sophisticated parties. I mean, we'll be generally we'll be dealing with sophisticated parties in this class. Uh, so the more uh, uh, realistic situation would be where the allocation lacks this term substantial economic effect. Substantial economic effect. And so when you put those together, I know these are terms we haven't yet defined PIP or substantial economic effect. They're not so easy to define in a few words, as we'll see. But when you when you put all this together, what it says is that you the way you're gonna determine allocations is first you're gonna look at the partnership agreement. And then you're gonna test, uh, you're gonna say how does the partnership agreement allocate these items? That's step one. And then step two is you're gonna test those allocations 
for substantial economic effect. And tax lawyers refer to substantial economic effect as a safe harbor. And it's, so if your allocations meet the substantial economic effect test, then they're blessed, they're good. If your allocations in the partnership agreement lack substantial economic effect, they're outside the safe harbor, they don't meet the safe harbor, then you have to reallocate in accordance with the partner's interest in the partnership agreement, the partner's interest in the partnership. You reallocate according to PIP. And as we'll see, the, the safe harbor, the substantial economic effect safe harbor, the beauty of it is that it gives you certainty. There's a uh, well, relative certainty. Um, you can give a tax opinion uh, that the allocation will be will be respected because it's a it's got some uh, meat to it. PIP, on the other hand, is a the old facts and circumstances test. Um, with that tax lawyers and planners don't like generally, or would all else being equal not like because there's not a whole lot of certainty. Um, it, facts and circumstances, um, and there's no um, guidance as to how to weigh different facts and circumstances. What Scalia used to really rail against the old facts and circumstances test, you know, that law would create, and they would tell you, here's a list of potentially relevant facts and circumstances. We're not going to tell you which ones are worth more, which ones are worth less. We're just going to let the judge figure it out. Um, and how do you plan in that context? And so the PIP standard is very amorphous. So that's the general approach. Um, let me talk before we get into a little bit more about substantial economic effect. Let's talk about why we care, why, why the IRS uh, uh, limits uh, this. And so we could imagine a world where you just say, look, you guys figure it out, partners, as long as everyone, uh, as long as all the tax items are in the aggregate reporting, uh, we don't care who it goes to. Go to partner A, partner B, and partner C, we don't really care. Um, and in a world, a very simple tax world where everyone is the same from a tax perspective, everyone's subject to the same tax rates, um, and there's no special nuances, we could do that. Because um, again, if A, is, and if A and B and C are all high rate individuals with no loss carryovers and the like, the IRS wouldn't care where ordinary income is allocated because the tax rate is going to be the same for all A, B, and C. Um, so they could say if A wants to take all the tax hit, presumably A is going to exact his or her pound of flesh from B and C, but what does the IRS care? They're getting their dollars. But once you look at it that way, then it becomes clear, well, in the current tax system where we have things like corporate taxpayers who are subject to now lower rates, right? 21% rate on corporate uh, income. Uh, corporations don't receive a capital gains preference. We have uh, US individuals who are fully subject to the US income tax. We've got foreigners who are only subject to US tax on US source income. Even, uh, so we have totally different types of taxpayers. Um, some who are fully subject to the highest rates potentially and some are not. Uh, in addition, we have different flavors of income and gain and we've got law, uh, capital gains. Uh, which are subject to low rates, but also are offsetable by capital losses. Um, we have 1231 gains and losses, the character of which depends on the total amount of 1231 gains and losses. You've got investment interest expense, which is allowed to the extent of your net investment income. And so once you realize that we have all these different nuances, if you just allowed people to allocate it however they wanted to and let them work out the um, the, the benefits and burdens, you see that partnerships can be used just to basically uh, flip uh, items to certain partners. So let's say I have a big capital loss carry forward. So allocate me a bunch of capital gains. I don't care. So I got a huge capital loss carry forward. I'll take those capital gains. I'll take them away from you, but you got to pay me something for taking them away from you. Um, let's say I'm a low rate taxpayer. 
Well, I'll take the ordinary income because it's low rate to me. I'll take it away from high rate taxpayers. Let's say there's tax exempt income that's generated by the partnership. Well, the high rate taxpayer is going to really want that, right? To save that high rate taxpayer 37 cents on a dollar. Low rate taxpayers can say, that's fine. Uh, I'm, it only saves me 15 cents on a dollar. Again, these partners aren't going to um, share these things in this way because of the kindness of their heart. Tax exempt income is still good for low bracket taxpayers. It's just not as good. And so there will be basically selling of tax attributes. High rate taxpayers will say, if you give me that tax exempt income, and in lieu of that, you take the taxable income, I'm going to give you something for taking that hit. And we're going to both be better off, and the government's going to be worse. So again, with a purely elective allocation regime, uh, all these differences among partners, types of tax payers, and differences in types of tax items would be exploited. And effectively, there would be selling of tax attributes. So if I have a capital loss carry forward, I can't sell that to somebody. You know, somebody says, oh, I got a bunch of capital gains this year. I sure would like to not have to pay it. And I said, I've got a lot of, I got a big capital loss carry forward that I'm not sure I'm ever going to be able to use. So it'd be great if I could sell that to you. You'd buy it for something less than your tax burden. And we could strike that deal. But in the U.S. tax system, we can't sell tax attributes. And what 704B does is basically saying, well, we're not going to allow you to sell tax attributes using a partnership. So the guy with the big capital gains and me with my big capital loss character, we can't form a partnership and effectively um, have me take on the capital gains hit um, because of my capital loss character. Okay, so what that says is that, again, we start out and say you can elect, but then we have some constraints and guardrails to sort of say, well, we're not going to allow you to effectively just sell your tax attributes through a partnership. And that's what substantial economic effect does. It tries to limit your flexibility in making allocations to tease out what we can call tax-motivated allocations. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Any questions? About any of that. So let's talk about substantial economic effect. Let's go into the regulations. So let's turn to 1.704-1. So now the fun begins in this class. 1.704-1. And you know you're in for some pain when you look at a regulation and it has a table of contents that looks like this. These 704B regulations are infamous, uh, but this is all of it. So if you ever get lost in the trees, you want to step back on the forest, we've seen parts of this. So we, we've we spent quite a bit of time on maintenance of capital accounts, basic rules, now we're going to see why the tax law cares about capital accounts. Treatment of liabilities. So we've been in this a little bit. Um, so this is uh, 1.704-1B1. It's kind of a typo there. This should be a B. Right there. But in general, let's start there. And this, again, is just sort of restating the code. Under 704B, if a partnership agreement does not provide for the allocation, you know, so the partnership agreement is silent, or if it does provide for the allocation, but such allocation does not have substantial economic effect, then the partner's allocation shall be determined in accordance with PIP. So that doesn't tell you anything the code doesn't tell you. If the partnership agreement provides for the allocation of income, so the partnership agreement is not silent, then there are three ways the allocation will be respected. These are the various ways that the allocation and an in, in agreement, the partnership agreement, will be respected. And the first and most obvious way is it'll have substantial economic effect. It'll be within the 
substantial economic effects safe harbor. Second, it could be that even though it doesn't have substantial economic effect, that the part the, the allocation is consistent with PIP. So even if it lacks substantial economic effect, if it's consistent with PIP, then it's good. And then finally, there's some uh, deemed rules that we'll get into. But this tells you, well, and then the last thing, it says the extent the allocation does not have some sort of effect, is not consistent with PIP, is not deemed, then it is reallocated in accordance with PIP. And so this tells you the approach, again, uh, that we're going to take uh, in testing and determining where allocations go. First, where does the partnership agreement say they go? Second, we'll test that allocation and agreement for substantial economic effect. If it has substantial economic effect, then we're good. The allocation is valid, will be respected, and it goes to that partner. If the allocation lacks substantial economic effect, then we'll determine uh, how it should be allocated under PIP, and the allocation will go that way. Okay, now we go to B2, 1.704-1B2, uh, and this is substantial e economic effect. And two-part analysis, and it's made at the end of the partnership taxable year. So again, December 31, we have to allocate items for the current year to the partners. We test on that date whether the allocations have substantial economic effect. Um, first, the allocation must have economic effect. And second, the economic effect must be substantial. A lot of word play here, right? But the bottom, and we'll talk about what these mean, um, but there's two different tests and we can put them in economic effect test and the substantiality test. What is economic effect? We have this fundamental principles, and this tells you what the reg writers are getting at. Um, but it really has nothing to do with the test. The test is quite formalistic. But what is economic effect? It's saying that in order for an allocation of economic effect must be consistent with the underlying economic arrangement, must be consistent with the economic deal. So that's constraining you. You can't just allocate tax items willy-nilly, they have to be consistent with the economic deal. What does that mean to be consistent with the economic deal? This means that in the event there's an economic benefit or economic burden that corresponds to an allocation, the partner who receives the allocation must receive such economic benefit or economic burden. Let me translate that into better English or more practical English, more pragmatic language. That means if you get allocating, if you get allocated a item of income, that must be economically good. That must benefit you. You must benefit from allocations of uh, items of income. If you get allocated items of loss or deduction, that's got to hurt you economically. So you can't separate the tax allocations from the economic benefit or burden of those allocations. You can't say, I'll just give you all the taxable income, all the ordinary income, but it's not gonna affect our deal because it's just tax. It's gonna, that basically, it's gonna take away the ability to say, oh, it's just tax, we don't, it's just tax. It's not gonna change our deal. No, you allocate a bunch of ordinary income to your partner, that's gonna be kind of bad for that partner for tax purposes, but good for that tax partner, that partner for economics, because they're getting a bunch of economic income. Um, and so that's the, the idea. We're going to tether the allocation of the economic deal. And so economic effect, that's again the principles, but the real test is there's two different tests. We're going to focus on the first one. It's called a general test. And it's really straightforward, but unfortunately it's not 
you, usually the alternate test is what's used. It has these three requirements. And so this general test, you can determine it. Uh, if you just look at the partnership, it has to have three uh, conditions called the big three requirements. So you have economic effect. Well, let me just say a word about substantiality because I haven't talked about that. So economic effect we focus on today and Wednesday, then we turn to substantiality. All I'll say about substantiality is it deals with the, with the possibility that uh, you could have offsetting allocations. So if I allocate a bunch of income to you in year one, but then allocate a, an offsetting amount of deductions to you in year two, by themselves, each allocation has economic effect, but viewed collectively, they cancel each other out. So substantiality is dealing with the possibility of, of uh, offsetting allocations. Again, I know that's pretty amorphous, but it'll become more clear. Uh, as we go through. So these three requirements, one we've already seen, you have to maintain your capital account. So now we know why the tax collector cares about capital accounts, book capital accounts, because it's basically using capital accounts as a way to ensure that allocations are consistent with the economic deal. So the partnership agreement has to have these the capital accounts maintain the way we, we've seen. And then again, there are more detailed rules in this B2 for low lines. And typically a partnership agreement, if it wants to be within the safe harbor, it's gonna just say capital accounts shall be maintained in accordance with treasury regulation 1.704-1B2 for low lines. Okay, so there you're maintaining the capital accounts. And two and three talks about how capital accounts are meaningful. And two says that the partnership agreement has to provide that upon liquidation of the partnership or any partner's interest in the partnership, that they're required to be made in accordance with positive capital account balances. So like your bank account is meaningful. When your bank account goes up because you put more money into your bank account, or when your bank account goes up because your bank account earns, you know, 0.01% interest these days. That's meaningful to you that your bank account goes up because when you liquidate your bank account, you're going to get the balance of that bank account. And that's like a capital account in the partnership. It's meaningful because when you liquidate your the partnership, the partnership's going to, you know, say sell all this assets and go away or you're gonna get cashed out by the partnership, uh, they're going, it's going to be, uh, you, the amount of cash you get is gonna be based on your capital account balance. Okay, so that means when you get allocated income, let's go back, your allocated taxable income, that's gonna increase your capital account under uh, rule one of the big three. And then under rule two of the big three, that's going to increase the amount you're paid when you liquidate your partnership interest. So it's meaningful. On the flip side, if you get allocated a dollar deduction, your capital account goes down, and that's going to cost you economically because now you're going to get less when you liquidate your interest. Any questions on one or two? Well, three is the problem practically, and three just has the inverse of two, which says if your capital account is negative, then you have to be obligated to restore the deficit balance unconditionally. Again, your bank account is a good analogy. If you overdraw your bank account, your bank account is negative, and then you say, well, I want to close this bank account. You're going to be obligated to contribute the amount of money to get your capital, your bank account back to zero. And this, this has to happen with capital accounts too. If you have a negative capital account balance, that's your obligation to restore that 
when you liquid when your interest is liquidated. If you have all three of these, then you can be sure that allocations of tax items are going to be economically meaningful, consistent with the economic deal. Whenever you get allocated positive items, your capital account goes up. That means either more money when you liquidate or less deficit restoration obligation when you liquidate. You get allocated negative items, losses and deduction. That means your capital account goes down, which means either less money when you liquidate distributed to you or greater deficit restoration obligation. Any questions on the third prong? So again, prong one is maintain capital accounts and two and three means capital accounts are meaningful or used. It doesn't make any sense to maintain capital accounts and then ignore them. Um, so, any questions on that? All right, so three is the big problem for most uh, planners, for most people who are drafting partnership agreements. Um, and it's because that limited partners or members of LLCs, um, their deal, uh, what allows them to feel comfortable investing is for them to have limited liability, that they are uh, required to, um, you know, the most they can lose is the amount they contribute to the partnership plus any explicit obligation to contribute in the future. So they can be certain that whatever the sum of those numbers is, that's the worst case scenario. To satisfy prong three, there has to be a, a provision in the partnership agreement that says that you as a partner are obligated to restore any deficit restoration, any deficit balance in your capital account, regardless of the size. So as a limited partner, you're not going to like that because you are exposed theoretically unlimitedly. If your capital account is negative a billion dollars, then you have a billion dollar deficit restoration obligation and you could be sued for that by the other partners or by creditors of the partnership. So typically that's a no-go for uh, prong three. Everybody understand that? So the reg writers understood that and created this alternate test. This is 1.704-1B2 to the lies D, the alternate test for economic. We're gonna focus on that next class. And this is again, gonna be more palatable because it only requires, if you start, parts one and two, and has other conditions. There's this alternate test. There's a, there's a set of, pro, of examples in 1.704-1B5, 1.704-1B5. So let's turn there, dash 1B5. You also know you're in a tough situation with regulations when the reg writers realize that the only way anyone could understand what they're saying is with a lengthy list of examples. And that's what happened, what we have in 704B. But um, we're going to start with example one here. And just to illustrate this, so we've got A and B form a general partnership. They each contribute $40,000 of cash and they buy depreciable property for 80. In the next sentence, you don't have to worry about 
can ignore it. You can cross it out. The partnership agreement provides that A and B will have equal shares of taxable income and loss, except for cost recovery and cash flow. So everything's equal in terms of cash flow, so cash distributions and taxable income and loss, but we're going to carve out cost recovery, depreciation. And it's going to provide that depreciation all goes to A. So everything's equal except cost recovery, depreciation deductions. All go to A. So, uh, and then the agreement provides that capital accounts will be determined and maintained. So we maintain our capital accounts, but upon liquidation of the partnership interest, distribution will be made equally. And no partner will be obligated to restore. So what this means is we have prong one, we've satisfied, we're maintaining capital accounts, but then somewhat ridiculously, we're then not using them because distributions are always going to be made equal. And if any of it is negative, they don't have to restore. So that, that's what the partnership agreement says. And then what happens is in the first year, the operating uh, income equals its operating expenses. So we have a net uh, break even except for depreciation. So what that means is we only have the depreciation to allocate. So sort of our cash income, our cash expenses offset, and we're left with this $20,000 cost recovery deduction. So we don't need to allocate our net operating expenses to zero. We just allocate the cost recovery deduction. Under the agreement, it's allocated entirely to A. So that's what we test. So we actually say, where is the depreciation allocated? It says to A. Now we test it for substantial economic effect. We start with economic effect. We start with a general test. In the general test, we have prong one, but we fail prong two and three. So the allocations lack economic effect on the general test. We're going to see they lack economic effect on the alternate test because that requires prongs one and two. We don't have prong two. And so this gets reallocated under PIP. And this is pretty easy. This is one of those easy cases when all distributions are going to be made equally and all contributions are equally are equal, then the PIP standard is going to be 50-50. And so what's going to happen under PIP is that half of that 20,000 cost recovery deduction to A under the agreement is going to be reallocated to B. And the bottom line is that this 20,000 depreciation, we step back, it's completely divorced from the economic deal. It's going all to A, but A is being treated, you know, it has no effect other than tax consequences. It doesn't re it reduces A's capital account, but nobody cares about capital accounts. It doesn't reduce A's entitlement to distributions or increase A's responsibility to uh, contribute to make deficit restoration payments. It's just tax. That's the only consequence it would have. And because it's just tax, it's ignored. It gets reallocated. Okay, so that's the general test. Again, Next class, we go and we do more on the, the alternate test. So uh, I want you to pay particular uh, um, interest, and we'll go through this next class. In the same example, B, uh, uh, dash one B five example one. We go two little eyes, all the way down to ten little eyes. Has a bunch of fact patterns that we're going to go through tomorrow. So pay particular attention. You don't have to worry about eleven little eyes, but just. Uh, example one, two little eyes through ten little eyes is going to be helpful uh, in exploring the alternate test for economic effect.
Okay, any questions on that? Okay, before we go, I just want to show you a little movie. This is the most famous. Um, uh, this is where 704 B regs were the most famous. So there was a, a movie back in the mid 90s called The Firm, the John Grisham novel. It was like his first big novel. And Tom Cruise was the star, and he was a tax lawyer. Um, it was like the high watermark for tax lawyers represented in, in Hollywood, because generally they were represented as very geeky, dorky types. And then you had Tom Cruise. Um, was the tax lawyer. So I had this one scene where he's at this CLE program and like all the lawyers, all of the people there, their like eyes are glazed over. It seems like they the, the they wanted to have something that was the most boring uh, and tedious thing possible. And so I'll show you this clip that I pulled off that movie.